Hey everyone, I'm Josh and I'm the Gatherings Director here at The River Church. And thanks for checking out one of our messages today. We would love to get connected with you and your family. And one easy way to do that is to text River Connect one word to 97,000. Or you can visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and some upcoming events. If you'd like to give to The River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can visit our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy today's message. Good morning, church. My name is Roy Townsend. I'm the Grow Pastor for The River Church, and I get a lot of questions. You know, what... what does the grow pastor do? What are they involved in? And here at Holly, we're super excited about all the growth community launches that we've had on Sunday morning. And that's a big part of what we do on the grow team is helping with our sermon series, the creation of our book, getting people to growth communities so that they can hear and be in a community of believers who can support one another, but also to be under the teaching of his word. Right, church? Under the teaching of his word. Because we're not going to get that often outside of the church. We're going to be out there in the world and we're going to be being hit by different messages in our culture and in our media and just in our communities. So it's an important aspect to what we do. We also deal with large women's events, men's events. We also uh, do our pastor's academy as our pastor's training program that we offer here at the church. But I'm super excited to be with you this morning. I ran into Pastor Caleb this morning and I go, this is the first time I haven't preached in a button-down suit ever. I was worried because I know he's a snazzy dresser, right? So I, he's a, I'm like, what do I have that looks less like me, more like him? But I don't know, this might be a, a, a slap at him. I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, He's probably like, I'd never be caught dead wearing what you're wearing, Roy. But it was the best I could, it was the best I could come up with. So, uh, super excited again to be part of the River Church. Each week when I stop and I, I contemplate and I consider and I get to see what, what we get to do. It's important. It's exciting. And we can't let that go, right, as a church, as, as, as believers. We can't just forget about it. So I am thankful to be locked arm in arm with those of you who call the River Church home. I'm thankful for the work that we do, and I'm, I'm thankful for things like our trunk or treat that's coming up, right? I'm thankful that Noble and Caleb and Ferd are going to take a pie in the face. I don't know. I think if we fill up, I think if we fill up all three containers, I think that's three pies. That's all I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Just, just in case you guys want to go for that, I think it could be negotiated. I'm sure it could be negotiated. Uh, I'm thankful for our growth communities. I'm thankful for our community center. I'm thankful that we get to not just love with the words and pointing people, but we get to love with actions and meeting needs and creating an environment and creating a relationship. As the grow pastor each week, we really are connected to the sermon series. And for those of you that are new or just catching up with us, we're in our second week of our series on the Sermon on the Mount. Pastor Caleb laid that out. You know, last fall we talked about the Beatitudes, the beginning of Matthew 5. We're going to be finishing Matthew 5 and we have plans for Matthew 6 and Matthew 7. But he touched on something last week and it really was meaningful for me as I was listening to his sermon he touched on how the world is decaying around us. I deal with a lot of older saints at some of the other locations. And you know, they're always so down about the decay in our culture, in our society, in our world. And we can become overwhelmed when we just focus on that over and over and over. And what I would like to focus on, or my encouragement to the church, is he taught last week that we're the salt of the earth. We're that preservative. And the way that we guard against what makes, what makes salt. I don't know, as I was considering that lesson, it really shocked me. I'm like, okay, I probably have salt in the cabinet from 15 years ago. And I'm pretty sure that if I stick my finger in that salt, 
and lick it, it tastes like salt. But I have it in a package. I have it on a shelf. I have it protected. And the contaminants don't make it in. And what we as Christians and believers and and a church body, what we have is we have his word. We have this word to direct us so that those contaminants don't make it in to our lives. We see over and over and over the world is making its way into the church. It's corrupting our flavor. It's corrupting the message as the message goes out. And we need to point people to Jesus and to help preserve and be that preserving agent in their lives. Unlike Pastor Caleb, though, I know he said he wouldn't eat anything if it was expired. I eat food that tastes good. So it, if it don't matter if it's expired, if it tastes good, I eat it, all right? So I, I'm pretty, pretty equal opportunity there. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 was the text that we used last week. And it says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. I had an experience. I had the privilege I was a school teacher, I was a school principal in between my times here at the church. And I had the privilege to go to France with a bunch of kids. And you say, why would you go to France? That doesn't sound like a lot of fun. It, we had a great time. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And part of the trip was we weren't supposed to eat at McDonald's when we're in France, although I did. And it's quite, it's quite a thing. It's quite a thing. You just don't understand. Even though it looks like McDonald's, there's, there's a lot of differences. But we're supposed to be a good model, right? I'm supposed to take the kids. I'm supposed to go into the bistro. I'm supposed to go into the cafe. And I get a bunch of kids like, we're going. We're going to lunch. We're going to sit down. And we sit down at this cafe in France. And I'm looking around the corners of the restaurant. And I'm seeing meat hanging on hooks on every wall of the restaurant. I'm like, oh, that's weird. I wonder if that's like a, a decoration. I, you know, I, I just sat down and I ordered, you know, big old chunk of ham and a baguette. And then they proceed, we're, we're practicing our French and they proceed to say how the food has not been cooked. And again, it's hanging. Oh, he just grabbed a big old chunk of ham. Huh, he just cut a big chunk off it and put it on my plate. And I'm sitting there and I'm terrified. We are going to die. I mean, I like to think I'm a tough guy and my family, we're, we're hillbillies, right? But we cook, we cook bologna. And we call that breakfast meat, okay? I mean, fried bologna and, and eggs, good cooking, all right? I have never had a piece of meat that's been hanging on the wall there. And they proceed to tell me that they had preserved and cured and aged that meat with salt. And I'm like, principal dies in Europe with 30 kids. <laughs> like, I know that they can eat it. I don't know that my body can eat it, right? I don't. Like, it might be good for them because they're used to it, right? Like, what could be growing? What could be happening when, when I eat this? What is preventing this from decay? I have to admit, church, I was losing my mind. It was delicious. As I said before, it doesn't matter what the expiration date, if it tastes good, I'll eat it. I finished the whole thing. But I was my first time I was introduced to the power of how salt can be a preservative like that. And we're also thinking today, we're the salt of the earth and we're going to be talking about the light where it says you are the light of the world. And we're, we're going to talk about that, but I started thinking that message, really, I would like to give that to the church. But there may be some here this today that aren't really part of the church, haven't come to know Jesus Christ as their savior. I thought of Acts chapter 20 
verses 20 and 21. It reads, How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, church, for those of you that aren't believers and you're here today and you're hearing me, listen, audience, there are movements out there. There's communities out there. There are churches out there that don't believe in a genuine repentance and a genuine faith in Jesus Christ. That genuine repentance comes from a turning away of our sins. We turn away by turning to God. We turn away by believing and accepting the gift that Jesus Christ has provided for us. And as the church, we're called to be that salt and to be that light. But so many times, this was so important that Jesus, before he ascends into heaven, told his disciples in Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 47, he says, And said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. There's movements out there, popular movements, political movements and social movements that say this is trash. There are churches out there that will tell you this is a fairy tale. Jack and the Beanstalk, the scripture. They go hand in hand. Listen, church, I want to remind the church, and if this is new to you, John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth. And the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. We can break that down if you'd like. In the Greek, it means no one. (laughs) It means no one comes to the Father except through me. I've heard a Famous pastors say, 95% of people are basically good. When I talk to people, they, we seem to buy into this, especially in our American culture. People tell me, especially the men, I want to pick on men for a second. They say, listen, I work. I pay my taxes. I provide for my family. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love mama. It's like a country song, right? (laughs) You're telling me something's wrong with me? Let's just be honest with ourselves, church. Let's be honest. There's a selfishness. I know there's a selfishness inside me. It's there. I'm always fighting. And if we're honest with ourselves, we know of the wrongs that we do in this world Let's not be proud people. Let's know that the scriptures say in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We could break that word all down in the Greek if you'd like. It's all. All have sinned. All have sinned. But we as a people and many people in our culture and many people in our world, we have been blinded to that truth that we are already on the path of condemnation. We are already in that terrible spot. People say, why would a God have to save us? We're familiar with John 3.16, but I like to pick up in John 3.17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. If we're all basically 95% good, either these scriptures 
are a lie or that statement is a lie. Because this said, all have sinned. This said that he sent his son to save. Verse 18 says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Already. Because he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. Church, genuine repentance and genuine faith go hand in hand. And I wanted to give opportunity before I got into the next part of the message that there's people here today who may not understand this and you can know that Jesus Christ is the Savior. You can accept that gift where you're at. Over and over again, I am reminded that today is the day of salvation. It's not tomorrow because you don't know if we have tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. So picking up in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, for those of you that grew up in the church, this this reminds me, and I, I know some people are new and might not understand, but it reminds me of that children's song, This Little Light of Mine, right? It was the original... Like a music video, right? It had hand motions. We were told to put our fingers up and that was our light. And we were, you know, moving our lights around. And this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Or some of us would go, shine, 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 shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Until I'm with my friends. Until I'm with my family. Until I'm uncomfortable. Until I go to work. Until I go to school. The song goes on, you know, the next verse. Hide it under a bushel. Just like this scripture talks about. Hide it under a basket. And we yell, no. I'm going to let it shine. But many times for me on Monday morning... Put my bushel over it. I don't want them to think I'm weird. I don't want them to to think I'm one of those other weirdos. I don't want them to think I'm crazy. I don't want them to undermine our relationship. I don't want to deal with all these questions. I just want to fit in. So hide it under, yeah, yeah. But the scripture here says you are the light of the world. It's interesting, this message was given to the ordinary people. It wasn't given to the powerful, the rich, the strong, the smartest. It was given to ordinary people. I'm giving you this Greek knowledge again. You are the light of the world. Do you want to know what you means? You. The connotation here is you and you alone are the light of the world. But I've heard this before, right? Jesus is telling those followers, those believers, you are the light of the world. But I'm like, as I've studied this and as I've read this, I know that Jesus has given this message that he is the light of the world. And when he gave that message, as I studied this, one of the commentators explained to me, I have a friend who's a Messianic Jew, Jewish rabbi. And sometimes I call him and give him the heart, like, hey, I don't understand this. You know, because we, like, this little light of mine, right? It's little light, you know, little light. And he's like, oh, you you guys have missed it. You know, you guys just don't understand. And as I studied this, when Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, he was standing in the temple, and there were four golden candelabras that were as high as the outer walls of the temple. 
And there was no candle on top of that candelabra. There were these large bowls. And these large bowls were filled with 65 liters of an oil that burns. And as part of a ceremony that the Jewish culture would, would stop to commemorate the pillar of fire that led them in the wilderness or the pillar of smoke, to commemorate that, they had this illumination of the temple. We thought we were the first ones to come up with the laser light show at Cedar Point. And they said when they would light these candelabras, this is not a little light, guys. The history books tell us that it was so much light that the whole city of Jerusalem could see the light. Now people are like, oh, big deal. The whole city of Jerusalem. At the time of Christ, the same amount of residents that live in Oakland County, Michigan lived in Jerusalem. To give you an idea, when he says, I am the light, it was the morning after those four candelabras had been burning in the temple that lit up the sky for 1.3 million people. It isn't this little light of mine when he says he is the light of the world. Similar to Oakland County. Interesting, in John chapter 8, verse 12, we get the description of this. And it says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of the world. One of the commentators I, I enjoy reading said, Christ was saying in effect that the pillar of fire that had been, had been between the Jews and the Egyptians that protected them in their exodus, he was saying, that was me. And when he says, you know, when he's saying this, this, this pillar that led them to the wilderness, and as they wandered in the wilderness, that was me. And this pillar of fire that consumed the tabernacle and then consumed the temple, that was me. He's saying, I am the light of the world. But now, he takes his teaching a step further for us in the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew 5, verse 14, it says, you are the light of the world. So he is the light of the world. And now, he is giving it to us. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Many of us enjoy the first teaching. We're pretty excited about it. Oh, Jesus is the light. I love Jesus is the light. I don't have to be the light. Jesus is the light. And I've often heard this taught, you know, that we are to reflect the light. Last night I was out on the back deck with my family. I didn't realize the moon was going to be out as brightly as it was last night and I had a water bottle with me and I set it down and there was a shadow. It's about 10 p.m. I'm like, whoa! I'm looking up at the moon and I'm, at, I'm like, man, isn't that awesome? My kids are sitting there and we're talking and I'm like, it's interesting, there's no inherent light in the moon. The moon is a dark place. The moon the sunlight hits the moon and then reflects to the earth to the point where it can cast a shadow. Interesting. So most of us are comfortable. We reflect the light. Most of us are comfortable. Jesus is the light. This is great. He's the light. I'm just trying to help show people. But here in Matthew chapter 5, he is taking it a step further, church. He's like, you are the light. Just like Pastor Caleb said last week, the word of God has to make its way into our lives. The word of God has to make his way into our thinking. The word of God has to make its way into our vocabulary so that we can preserve the teachings of Christ. And then now we're getting this knowledge that supernaturally, that we are going to be a partaker in this light. The world thinks that they know where this light is. The world has come up with, 
with teachings. The world says that they are so smart that they tell us there is no God. The world has become so smart and they think the light of their knowledge is to tell you that there is no God. Their knowledge tells us they're so smart that you were created on accident. Yep, you were, you know, big boom and little slime and then the slime kept growing. You're, you were an accident. Even though when we look, we can see the intelligent design behind saying there's a creator. The world is so smart that they say we can, we can have sexual relationships with as many people as we want without consequence. That we can live with people in a sexual relationship and not be married to them. You don't have to worry about that. Those archaic teachings. The world has become so smart that they tell us homosexuality is a natural part of the world. The world is so smart that they tell us that you can't tell your kids whether they're boys or girls. Even though at the chromosomal level, that when they find my bones and they dig them up and they test my bones, they will know not what I thought I was. They will know if I was a man or a woman. The world is so smart that they tell us our scriptures are a bunch of fairy tales. And when we become part of Christ through repentance and through a genuine faith, God is teaching that you become the light of the world. Let's read again in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So he is the light and you are the light. And this is a great mystery in this dark, dark world. Interestingly enough, you know, we're hung out in space and a dark space is our world. And our world has no inherent light except a light that shines on us, right? It's a dark place. Each week I hear of people struggling on many fronts, whether that be with addictions, depression, feelings, thoughts, evil things that have been done to them, that decay, we can see that decay all around us. And we know that that decay happens through the sin that came into this world. Ephesians Chapter 6, verse 12 tells us, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Church, we have to realize that we are the light and we have to be this light. We have to demonstrate this light. Interestingly enough, I taught a class to a bunch of high schoolers in psychology. And sensory perception is one of the things that we would taught. And I found this very interesting. Think to yourself for a second. How far can the flame of a candle be seen by the naked eye? I'd always ask the kids this. Say, how far... Can the flame of a candle be seen by the naked eye? If I were to get on I-75 right here in front of this location and go all the way to the far side of the Great Lakes Crossing Mall, 15 miles, a single candle flame can be seen that far. How? I can't see 200 yards. I know I've got those reader glasses. I'm cheating today. How is that possible? It 
depends on the depth of the darkness. If it is pitch dark, pitch darkness, a single flame can be seen 15 miles away. They've done studies. They have seen flames up to 30 miles away. This world is that level of darkness, church. This world is that level of darkness. And when he is teaching us and was teaching those that were there as his followers, you are the light of the world. Some of us are like, oh, well, he's the light. He is the light. And he allows us to be partakers in that gift of being the light. And what if I'm just a single candle? You can be seen 15 miles away. In the darkness. And we don't wrestle just against the darkness. We wrestle against this present darkness. And we are called. We are given this promise. As a follower and as a believer. That we will be the light of the world. John 3 verse 19 Teaches, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Why are we so distraught when we're fighting the world? It's how Jesus was treated. Think about that. I'm a follower of Jesus. What did they do to him? They hated him. I don't like it when they hate me. How did they treat Jesus? They persecuted him. I'm a follower of Jesus. I don't like it when they persecute me. They killed him. I don't like it when I feel like they're killing me, trying to kill me. You are the light. Of the world. This is a mystery. Second Peter chapter 1. Peter kind of gives us a little commentary on this, this area of scripture that we're focusing on. It says in 2 Peter 1 verse 4. By which he has granted to us this precious and very great promises. So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Church, we know. We know that the world is so smart that they tell us that there's no God. But I taught history classes, and history is the compilation of his story. Not only is there a God, but that God loved us so much and we were condemned already that he was willing to throw us a life draft. And that life draft is Jesus Christ who said, I am the way. But people stump us and make us cower back and make us put a bushel over our light. Well, why would a loving God send people to hell? No, they're going to hell already. You're condemned already. The sin is here already. And he has sent Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. The world is so smart again. They tell us that you were created by accident. You weren't created by an accident, church. You're here to be the salt and the light to this world. Think of that. People, oh, I just don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. I just don't know going to raise my kids. I'm going to work 30 years. I'm going to get a check on the first of the month. I just don't know what I'm here for. You're here to be the salt. You're here to be the light. That should excite you. The explanation of the light is that you're partaking in this divine nature. I just don't know. You know, you might think I'm weird just going to tell my kids and my kids alone, maybe my grandkids. You're here to be the salt. You're here to be the light. 
You weren't created by accident. There is a God. He tells us that there are consequences for having sexual relationships outside of marriage. And that marriage should be between a man and a woman. It's pretty clear. I know that people are like, well, you know, it doesn't really say that. No, it really does. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that's hard to explain. I'm sorry that you don't like it. But the scripture does teach that. I mean, people come every week with no, new humdingers. I got to start writing them down. I'm like, huh? Like, I don't know what language you're reading it in or what glasses you're wearing. But no, it's pretty clear. doesn't mean, as Pastor Caleb said last week, that we don't speak the truth with love. Of course we speak the truth with love. But you can't accept that we get to rewrite the scriptures to fit that movement or to fit that church that wants to tell you 95% of you are good. I know I'm not good, church. I know it. I need a savior. I know it. I don't want to mislead anybody. I'm preaching to myself this morning too. I need to realize that I'm here to be the salt. I need to realize supernaturally I get to be the light. We take a lot of questions about the world saying that homosexuality is just a natural part of the world. And they say over and over again to me that the scripture does not address this. So real quickly, Romans chapter 1. Verses 26 through 32. Romans chapter 1 verses 26 through 32 says, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. I don't know how else to say it. How else to teach it. The world is so smart that they're telling us that you can't tell your children if they're male or female. It's up to them to decide. And yet the scripture clearly says male and female, he created them. We can accept this gift of God's word that will help us be salt in this world. We can accept this gift of his word that penetrates our lives through study and personal relationship with Jesus Christ in growth communities, in devotions, in reading, in applying, in talking, in discussing. We can apply this so that we know the light. Matthew chapter 5 Verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. So that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Okay, church. Okay. Okay, Roy. We're tired of hearing it. We are the light. But we're afraid to let our light shine. Okay, Roy, we get it. But it says that it's like a city that can't be hidden. I was thinking of this. On that same trip that I was able to go to France where I didn't die from the ham and baguette. They said, we're going to go to this town called Mount St. Michael in English. Mount St. Michael. I was like, okay. And they're like, listen, you can't miss it. I'm like, you can't miss it? What do you mean you can't miss it? I mean, I can miss the McDonald's exit and it's 100 feet away. 
I can miss it. When I need to go to the restroom driving down the interstate, I can miss it. It is possible for me to miss. They're like, no, you can't miss this. I'm like, okay, you got to explain it to me. And as I, we're on this bus and there's about 40 of us and we're, we're in Normandy, France. I know you've, many of us have heard of Normandy and it's slithering down this coastline and all of a sudden I see Mount St. Michael. And for those of you that don't know, it is a hill about a mile out into the ocean. And on that hill is a city. Riding in that bus. I'm looking. I'm like, you know what? You can't miss it. You can't miss it. The bridge that we rode across. I'm like, what's going to happen? And they're like, oh, when the tide comes in, the road is gone. For those of you that don't know, the tide fluctuates about 50 feet. Different tides. They rove us across there. I was at the bottom of that city on that hill and I'm looking up and on the top of that hill is a medieval church. You can't miss it. And the bus went back across the bridge and the tide came in and I'm sitting there on that hill in that city and it cannot be missed. You cannot miss it. Forty kids trapped on an island out in the ocean. It's about a mile out. We started to walk the streets of that city. And all of the streets head up to the top where that church is. We got to the top of that city that couldn't be hidden. A group of 45, 50 believers. And we're here and we're on that city top, in that church, looking out, and we cannot be hidden. One of the teachers looked at me and said, we should sing. We gathered around and grabbed hands and we sang from the top of that city. The message of Jesus Christ. It's unmistakable, church, that the function of being that city, the function of being that light is to illuminate Jesus Christ for all around us. When it's hard and when it's easy, church, to provide light on those issues that we've discussed. They're they're talking about this issue. Lovingly, you are the light. Lovingly, you are the salt. Who's going to tell them the truth? Who's going to teach the truth? And all this is done so that they see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Church, Are you the light? Church, are you the salt? For those of you who know Jesus Christ as your Savior and have him as Lord of your life, we don't get to choose this. It was given to us. We don't get, you know, eh, I'll do a lot of things, but I don't want to be salt. I'll do a lot of things, but I don't want to be light. We are partakers in the divine nature through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me, church? Pray with me, please. Lord, we love you. Lord, I ask for forgiveness where we fail you. 
Lord, I ask that this truth of being the salt and the light would permeate our lives. Through the study of your word and God's word being an integral part of our light and being rooted in our life, we can be that light. Lord, help us to not be afraid, but help us to be bold. Lord, help us to not do this incorrectly and in our own will, but to do it through the power of the Holy Spirit and to do it through love. We love you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.